As we prepare uh, to uh, to hear from uh, from the Reverend Dr. Daniel Cruz, uh, I want to uh, say a few words uh, of introduction about him. I know many of you, uh, if not all of you, uh, maybe uh, know Daniel, uh, but uh, a couple of uh, relevant things uh, pertaining to uh, to our day uh, and to our topic. Uh, Daniel is uh, translator of Rudolf Rican's uh, History of the Unity of the Brethren. Uh, and also the author of Faith, Hope, Faith, Love, and Hope, a history of the Unitas Rostrum. Uh, Daniel uh, received a PhD in historical theology uh, with a dissertation uh, focused on the soteriology of John Pass, his theology of salvation uh, from the University of Manchester. Uh, and as uh, many of you know, uh, Daniel recently uh, retired from uh, uh, as being the archivist for the Southern Province. We are very glad to have Daniel here. Uh, and as I and, and maybe many of you have uh, have come to know uh, Daniel's wisdom and humor and humility uh, as being a, a notable qualities that, uh, that we have all come to admire. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to introduce Daniel and um, uh, all of us, I'm sure, will appreciate his words as uh, he uh, uh, teaches us about uh, John Huss and his legacy uh, and meaning for us. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out on this sort of chilly morning to hear and think and talk together about someone who died 600 years ago <laughs> and whose life was basically determined by disputes between the realist and nominalist philosophy schools, a total breakdown in papal politics, and the fact that in general Germans and Czechs don't like one another. <laughs> it sounds like a really exciting topic. <laughs> we usually remember Huss as a courageous martyr, and of course so he was. We'll be getting into that in a little while. Uh, and what I'm supposed to do in this section is to basically tell you about the life of Huss and what it was all about, uh, and then we'll get a chance to reflect on that later on in the day. Uh, but 600 years after his death, it doesn't so much matter that Huss said something, but that he said something that is and why do we care? It's a good story, as I hope you will find out as we go through the morning, but uh, what has all of this to do with us other than some vague historical connection? Well, if you look at what was going on in the time of us, you find that times were changing very rapidly. The old ways just weren't working anymore. There was a lot of confusion. People wonder, is there anything true? Is there anything we can hold on to? And the Christians' confidence was shaken in a lot that they had taken for granted before that. It actually sort of sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway. But Huss proclaimed Christ as the sure foundation in any age and he saw the individual conscience as the arena where all of those questions had to be played out and answered. And so people in his day were looking for answers, just as we in our day are looking for answers, uh, and the assurance that the answers are true. Uh, he was interested not just in, as they had done before, authority spoke and all obeyed, uh, but on the other hand, neither was he a total rebel in that he didn't care what anybody else thought. Uh, he, he never confused freedom with doing whatever you want to do. And he was firmly grounded in, in Scripture uh, and uh, the witness of sincere Christians in his day and the living presence of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And his motto which is actually the motto of the Czech Republic today, was Pravda Vítěž, which truth will conquer. <laughs> truth will prevail is actually what it is. And uh, by the way, the flip chart is for me to write down some of these names for you so that you can sort of see what they look like. Uh, 
and may be easier to hold on to them. They, uh, they're not the most easy to pronounce. Uh, in fact, you mentioned the Shichan translation I did, which was used for a while at the uh, <coughs> seminary, and Dave Schatzneider, who taught it, never did learn to pronounce the Czech names. He would go way around to say, the bishop referred to on page 34. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll do a little better than that today. Well, John Huss. Our society today is totally different in so many ways from that of John Huss' time. The social institutions and ways of thinking are very, very different, even though we have some of the, a lot of the same questions and anxieties. Uh, and so soon there were members of the Christian church scattered in little bits and pieces throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, there were persecutions. You remember Neo, uh, Nero and uh, the throwing Christians to the lions and all of those stories, which did happen from time to time uh, throughout the 100s and 200s, though there really were few general persecutions. We sometimes think of all of the early Christians as huddled in the catacombs waiting for the Romans to come after them. Uh, by and large, that didn't happen. Uh, but still, it was an uneasy time. You never knew when something might happen. Until about the, the year 312, when the Emperor Constantine uh, decided that, uh, well, you know, he saw the vision of the cross uh, and the Cairo in the, in the sky before a great battle he was to fight. And he won, so he thought that Christ had given him the victory. And so he therefore legalized Christianity. And soon it was the religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, by 325, the church had gotten together in Nicaea, had formulated the basis of what we call today the Nicene Creed, uh, which says that Christ is one substance with the Father. In other words, Jesus is God. Uh, things began to percolate after that by the early 400s, Jerome had translated the scriptures into the Latin uh, common language of the people, and all seemed to be going great. And then, Rome fell, 410. The barbarians invaded, everything disintegrated, uh, and uh, though what we sometimes forget is that these were not heathen barbarians coming in. But they, by and large, had already been converted to Christianity. Um, Arians, yes, but, uh, you know, still it was, it was not just starting over again. But, the, you know, gradually things settle down as they do. Um, but this resulted in the church becoming the repository of knowledge and stability in the world, uh, more so certainly than it had been before. Uh, and then by 451, they had met at the Council of Chalcedon and had decided ha that Jesus is truly divine and truly human uh, and, uh, you know, two natures, one person, all of that. So basically, Christianity is settling down to something that, that we would recognize today. Uh, of course, Mohammed had started a rival religion in <laughs> Islam. Uh, but uh, in the 700s, the Muslims were pushed back from most of Europe, uh, and uh, so Christianity was able to uh, maintain itself. Uh, 756, the uh, King Pepin uh, gave the, the Pope land, and that was the beginning of the Papal States. Uh, it was really his own country, and that, that unfortunately led to even more secularization uh, in, the, uh, in the church. It became a worldly power as well as a spiritual power, and that was going to cause problems. Uh, but still, 800 comes along, and Charlemagne is crowned Holy Roman Emperor uh, in sort of a way of trying to get back to the stability of the old Roman Empire. Of course, if you remember your history, uh, the Holy Roman Empire is defined as neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Um, but at times it worked okay, and we'll, we'll run into Holy Roman Emperors as we go through uh, Huss' story. 
by 863, Cyril and Methodius had brought Christianity to Bohemia and Moravia, which is, of course, of great interest to us. Uh, and then soon after a thousand, the Eastern and Western churches had sort of had a final split. Um, you see, I'm having to race through a lot of this. Uh, the 1100s, there was the Crusades of unfortunate memory. Uh, but in all of this, the uh, Christian faith had developed uh, into a rather orderly system of beliefs and practice. There were seven sacraments. Uh, the hierarchy was in place. You had your bishops and priests and deacons and everything was running fairly smoothly. Uh, unfortunately, the church I mentioned had received uh, temporal lands, uh, and that occurred elsewhere as well, so that uh, the bishops and monasteries become wealthy landowners and became more and more wealthy as time went on <coughs> due to the uh, generous contributions of Christians. Uh, sometimes purely for piety, and sometimes I think as a sort of hedge against damnation. You know, if you're coming to the end of your life, and you maybe haven't kept quite all of the commandments, maybe if I give this farm over here to the monastery, they'll put in a good word, and I can, you know, get out of purgatory a little sooner, or, you know, who knows? It can't hurt. But you do that for a few centuries, and the church ends up with a lot of property. Um, not like Salem Congregation, that's a different thing, but <laughs> that's another talk. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, the feeling of, of fellowship with the saints where you, you ask the saints to, uh, to pray for you, to help, uh, particularly the Blessed Virgin Mary. I mean, you know, if you want to get in good with somebody, be nice to their mother. So, you know, it makes perfect sense. Uh, the idea of purgatory, a state after death where if you hadn't been bad enough to go to hell, but you still needed to have your, your sin sort of burned away, but it was temporary, you could get out. But then if all of the other saints in Christ have all of this merit laying around, maybe you could do something to get them to apply it to you. So indulgences were uh, given to very, very simply and not quite accurately to reduce your time in purgatory. Uh, but by the 1200s, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas had made a nice system out of all of the uh, beliefs of the church, and things seemed to be going along pretty well again. Uh, closer to where we're going to be talking about, uh, Charles IV, who was the king of Bohemia, had gotten himself elected Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, he wanted to do something to make his capital city of Prague the worthy of, you know, Paris and Rome and these other places. So uh, he uh, had uh, gotten Prague to have its own archbishop. Uh, he did great building uh, programs within the city. Uh, and uh, things were looking up on that score. Uh, of course, then 1347, the Black Death came through and about a third of the population died. So that put a crimp in things and sort of unsettled things. But uh, and there were also uh, some, uh, like John Wycliffe in England had, was calling for a reform in the church. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the realists and nominalists in philosophy were beginning to really go at it. Uh, but uh, the church had settled down into uh, a basically stable institution where people knew what they had to do. Uh, these new ideas were beginning to cause some questions, uh, but uh, there was, uh, you know, something people could hold on to. But there was always room for improvement, and we never, you know, we sometimes think along came the Protestants and they wanted to reform all of the evils of Catholicism. Well, that is simply not true. The Catholic Church itself ha always had many uh, very pious, loyal uh, people who wanted to do what was right. Uh, like any human institution, it sometimes got a little off, but people like St. Francis of Assisi, you know, were there to call them back. Uh, and uh, so it was in, um, in Bohemia. Uh, 
we think of Huss as the great reformer, but he didn't just appear one day and say, I think I'll reform the church. He was part of a Czech reform movement, which for about a half century before that uh, had been uh, working to call the church back more uh, to uh, what they saw as its New Testament roots uh, and real, uh, real foundation. Uh, and there were there were some predecessors of Huss, uh, whom I won't go into great detail about. Uh, Conrad Waldhauser was called to, by Charles IV to come to Prague because Charles said, yeah, I've got all these nice buildings, but the morals of the people are pretty bad. So he called in a, well, uh, sort of revival preacher, we would call it today. Uh, Conrad Waldhauser. Uh, was one of those. Unfortunately, he was German, and the Czechs weren't too sure about that because already the antagonism between Czechs and Germans had arisen. Uh, my personal favorite of these predecessors, and this I want to write up, it's not that he's all that important in the whole scheme of things, uh, but his, n excuse me while I write, Okay, and then the fun part is putting on the accent. Milich of Kromyashish. It's just like it's spelled. Um, he had a, a great uh, influence in Prague uh, with calling the church to be more what the church should be, to not concentrate so much on possessions as on serving the needs of people. Uh, and uh, he uh, said we need to return more to scripture, we need to help the poor and the unfortunate, uh, and uh, really had uh, a great influence, so much so that uh, some of his lay followers gave money to build a place, a chapel in Prague, uh, where uh, the gospel would be freely proclaimed, and that was Bethlehem chapel, and we'll hear more of that later in Huss' career. Um, but um, then, of course, now, I don't want to get too tied up here, but Milich um, was an interesting fellow. Uh, he came from Moravia, and the people in Prague looked down on people as Moravia as being country bumpkins. And they have an accent. And I said, you know, Milich preaching there in Prague was sort of like some uh, tent revival preacher from Alabama going to Times Square in New York. And they thought he talked funny. But they liked what he said, so it, it came on. So that was, that was a vital part of what Huss uh, came into uh, as uh, he came to Prague himself. Now, there was one more, before we get to the birth of John Huss, only about 10 minutes into the talk, uh, one more thing we have to realize. I said the medieval church had gotten itself pretty well worked out, um, but in 1378, there came an event which caused great consternation. It's called the Great Western Schism. Now, you know in the Catholic system, the Pope is seen as the vicar of Christ, the ruler on earth of the church. Uh, and that works okay, but after some other disputes, uh, Urban VI was elected Pope, and the cardinals who had elected him suddenly decided he's a real jerk. He, he was just, just personally obnoxious, and so they said, okay, we'll depose him and elect another Pope. Well, this causes confusion because if the Pope is the one and only vicar of Christ on earth, you can't have two of them. And this was the more troubling because there had been anti popes in the past, uh, but this was the legitimate electors of the Pope, the cardinals, had now said, no, we were wrong, we've got another one. Uh, this began to cause some real problems and confusion in the minds of people in the late 1300s in Europe. Uh, and the problem was that neither one of the popes would back down, so now you have Europe splitting into, well, I support 
this line of popes and I support that line of popes. And uh, we'll see later that it gets even more fun. But uh, this is about what's going on uh, just after 1372 when John Huss was born in the little village of Husinets. Uh, and we're not sure if exactly of the year of his birth because unfortunately they did not have a competent archivist and the uh, <laughs> baptismal register was lost. <laughs> but it was sometime around then. Uh, his parents were certainly not wealthy, but they were not, uh, you know, lower class peasants as they, as many were in that day. They, they had a little bit of money, enough that they could send him to school. Uh, and uh, yeah, around 1390, his parish priest was impressed enough by him uh, to arrange to get him a scholarship to the University of Prague where he could study for the priesthood. And that was really the only way to success for somebody in that society unless you happen to be of the nobility or of a big military family or wealthy merchants. You went into the church and that's the way you made your way in life. Uh, now Huss didn't have it easy in Prague. Uh, his scholarship covered his cost of tuition but you know you still have to eat and that didn't, that didn't cover that. Uh, sometimes he begged in the streets. Uh, luckily he had a fine singing voice and so he was able to get jobs pay, uh, singing in church choirs that would pay soloists. Uh, so he got a little income that way uh, for regular services, probably for funerals, etc. Uh, remember back when we were in seminary, the vulture squad where you would go around and be pallbearers at funerals and make ten bucks <laughs> which in 1968 was enough to really go out and have a you know, really nice dinner on. Uh, so Huss did the equivalent of that. Uh, he later wrote that as a hungry little student, I would uh, make a spoon out of my bread to eat my peas. And when I'd finished my peas, I would eat my spoon as well. Uh, but by hook or crook, uh, he did manage to get through the schooling. And he confessed later that his motives then were not so much because of religion and piety, uh, but he was looking for an, a nice, secure place in life where he could be warm, he would have shelter, he would have clothing, uh, and uh, life could be fairly comfortable. Uh, now, I, this is not as well documented, but there is, there is some mention that he also supplemented his income by playing chess and gambling. Uh, but we will not take that too seriously. Though he did uh, take part in a, a student, uh, well, they called it the Feast of the Ass, and they would bring, bring a, a donkey in with somebody sitting on it, riding backwards, dressed up like a bishop and with all the fancy hat and all of that. And uh, anyway, it was a, just an excuse for the students to riot and get drunk. Uh, but Huss apparently enjoyed it at the time. Uh, though later his conscience sort of got on him, so he scraped together his you know, few little coins he had left and bought himself an indulgence to hopefully get out of purgatory for what he had done there. Um, now, so how did this student, uh, who seems to be pretty much like any other college student of the time, how did he end up as a great religious leader? Well. There was no Damascus Road conversion experience. You know, God didn't appear to him and say, John, I want you to reform the church. Uh, it seems to have been more a, a, a gradual deepening of his mind and spirit of learning to take things more seriously and to seeing things as they are. Um, his main teacher uh, at Prague was Stephen of Colleen, who was a follower of Milich. Uh, and so he passed on the, re, re, uh, the uh, reform tradition in that way. Uh, and particularly the idea of uh, faith formed by love, meaning basically uh, that your faith is determined by love for Christ, love for one another, and that your faith has to result in actions. You know, theoretical piety doesn't count. It's what you do with it that matters. And that became uh, a uh, prime 
statement of Huss and indeed of the whole Hussite movement out of which we eventually came. Uh, anyway, 1393, Huss gets his Bachelor of Arts degree. Uh, he receives the minor orders of ordination, uh, sort of the preliminaries towards being ordained to the priesthood. Uh, but he didn't have any wealthy backers, uh, and so he wasn't going to get a church even if he finished, because back then uh, the nobility and all pretty well appointed who the priests were. It took money or friends and influence to get a church, uh, and so he decided he would continue with an academic career uh, to uh, support himself. Uh, he wasn't a very good student. Uh, I always, if I'm talking to folks who are still in school, uh, point that out to them. I think Huss came in eighth in a class of 11. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to be a genius for God to do something with your life. Uh, I also have always taken uh, great solace in the fact that Einstein flunked geometry, you know. So there is hope for all of us. Anyway, 1396, he gets his Master of Arts degree, and he lectures there at the university on uh, Aristotle. He was sort of like a, a teaching grad student, as we would call it today. Uh, and by 1398, he was appointed to the full faculty there. Uh, and it is that time that he changed his name or the way he signed it. Before that, he had always listed himself as Jan of Husenitz. And after he got his M.A., he became Master John Huss. Uh, so in June of 1400, he was ordained a deacon, which is the step just before being uh, ordained a priest. And already by 1401, uh, he did something that brought the notice of the public to him for the first time. Uh, as you know, there were wars all the time at that time, and the Germans and the Czechs were typically fighting. Uh, and uh, this particular one, when German soldiers of Ruprecht of the Palatinate uh, invaded Bohemia, uh, in a dispute with the king of Bohemia, uh, Václav or Wenceslas, yes, the same name as good King Wenceslas, it's just this is about seven generations later than that particular Wenceslas. This is Wenceslas IV. I know some of you thought it was Wenceslas III, but it was Wenceslas IV. <laughs> uh, anyway, for Holy Roman Emperor. Well, the thing is that these German mercenary troops had torn up Jack, burned down villages, peasants were left without food, and uh, Huss uh, delivered a public protest against this, uh, saying that how can Christians do this to one another? And you can see this builds on the faith formed by love, that your faith has to result in actions. How can you say you have Christian faith and treat one another like this? Which is a question that is still true. But uh, I wanted to note particularly this, it, you know, Huss began to be known a little bit from this, uh, but I think it's significant that his first foray into public, you know, notice uh, was not on an abstract theological question, but on a social issue. How do people treat people? Uh, and that always went hand in hand. Uh, he was ordained a priest in 1401. Uh, and he stayed on at the university, but was given a chance by a friend to preach in one of the local Prague churches. So he began to be known as a um, you know, pretty popular uh, preacher. He also, in 1401, became dean of the philosophical faculty for the winter semester. Now that sounds like a big deal. Uh, actually, all the faculty had to take this position in turn uh, basically, it meant you had to chair faculty meetings, and those who have had to do with university know what a joy and privilege that is. Uh, <coughs> so it wasn't as big a deal, but it sounds nice, at least. <coughs> um, however, he did record that in addition to having to suffer through faculty meetings, he did find time in the evenings to, to have pleasant conversations uh, at the shop of Wenceslas the Cupmaker. Basically, it was a bar. And uh, he and his friends sat there and discussed the, uh, uh, the issues of the world and probably got a good bit of benefit from that. Uh, now, unfortunately, 1401 also marks the 
the date when Huss's friend, Jerome of Prague, uh, who had gone to England to study at Oxford, uh, came back bringing the theological works of John Wycliffe, uh, the English reformer, uh, which the church in England had already condemned as heretical. But they really caught on in Prague and became the discussion, a uh, matter of much discussion. Uh, and uh, two issues particularly. Uh, one, I don't think will stir up a lot of debate today, the idea of remanence, that the substance of the bread and wine remains in the, in the Holy Communion even after the consecration when the body and blood of Christ become present. Uh, yeah, I don't see people getting up. It's sort of like when we were talking with the Lutherans about the presence of Christ in the sacrament. And I said, you know, it's like the 300-pound canary any way he wants to. And that was okay. <laughs> the other issue, uh, mainly from Wycliffe, however, was that of dominion. And that was the idea that you receive all of your authority directly from God. And therefore, you're an agent of God. If you do not follow God, then you lose your authority and possessions. Now remember, this is the time when the church was very wealthy. And Wycliffe had said that uh, if the church is not being the church, if it's abusing its wealth and position, then it is not only the uh, the right, but probably the duty of the secular authorities to seize all of that wealth from the church uh, and therefore purify the church. Well, if you're the king of Bohemia and you're looking around and realize that one-third of the land and property in your kingdom is owned by the church, if somebody says, hey, there's a way you can get your hands on that, that becomes a very big issue. Uh, and uh, much more than remanence or any of those other things. Well, we'll see that playing into the story a little bit later. Uh, but uh, we, and by the way, that's not the first time that politicians have spouted religious jargon for secular gain, just as a note as we go by. You might want to consider that a little bit. Uh, anyway. Uh, by 1402, in March, Huss became preacher in Bethlehem Chapel. He became really well known to the populace at that time. Uh, and uh, lest the title Bethlehem Chapel confuse you, we think of that as just a little building, you know, on the side of a church. <coughs> Chapel meant that it was not a parish church, but a, a church building for special use, uh, and it would hold 1,100 people. Uh, and Huss became so popular uh, that he would preach every day during the week uh, and to pretty well a standing room only audience. By the way, they had no pews or chairs in there, so uh, it was a standing room audience. Um, but at this point, Huss in 1402 has just about reached the pinnacle of worldly success. He's a dean at the university. He's a popular preacher. Uh, he doesn't have to worry about using his bread spoon to eat his peas anymore. Uh, so things are looking good. Uh, but in 1403, things began to go a little bit sour. Uh, I mentioned that this uh, Wycliffe's theological ideas uh, had uh, been brought back by Jerome of Prague. They were con discussed at the university. And fortunately, 24 of the articles had been condemned already in England as heretical. Uh, and the German faculty at the University of Prague added 21 more articles, which they said were heret heretical. Uh, and uh, now we have to realize here, the University of Prague, like much of Czech society of the time, uh, was divided between Germans and Czechs. And in the university, for some strange reason, the German faculty had the majority of seats uh, and therefore the majority of the votes. And it was always jockeying back and forth between the Germans and the Czechs as to who's going to control things. And it didn't so much matter what the issue was. Uh, if the Germans said it's black, the Czechs said it's white. If the Czechs said it's black, the Germans said it's white. It didn't really matter. Uh, <clears throat> but you can see that things are going to begin to get a little 
bad here because as soon as uh, the Germans realized the Czechs were really getting turned on by some of these ideas of Wycliffe, they condemned them, which meant the Czechs supported them even more. Uh, and uh, Huss himself took a moderate view. Uh, in the faculty meeting, he made a very level-headed, quiet, middle-of-the-road speech, which meant he was totally ignored. Uh, however, two of his friends, Stanislav of Znoimo, and you can probably spell Stanislav, but Znoimo, Could you pronounce that, please? Znoimo. 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 And Stephen Palec uh, became the, the leading spokesman for the Czechs and the Wycliffeite people. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned realism and nominalism. You don't need to really worry too much about what those were, only to know that the Germans were nominalists, so therefore the Czechs were realists. Or maybe the Czechs were realists and therefore the Germans were nominalists. But, you know, anyway. Uh, so they brought, brought all of that kind of controversy into it as well. Uh, but as I say, the Germans on the faculty had the majority of votes, and so all of 45 of Wycliffe's articles were condemned as heresy. Now, <clears throat> that is laying there, waiting for something else to stir it up. Uh, in 1403, the uh, Archbishop of Prague, whose name was Zbigniew, of Hassenberg, um, who, who, it's Czech. Uh, he had actually been a soldier, a general, but when he got too old to do that very effectively, he needed something else to do, and so, as was commonly done at the time, he bought himself an archbishopric. Um, and, um, however, he didn't know much about theology, and he confessed that all of the fine points of the realism, nominalism didn't make any sense to him, but he was very anxious to do, you know, a, a good presentable job as being the archbishop, and he didn't want to condone heresy uh, in his territory. He also was offended by the morals of the clergy, which apparently a lot of them were no better than they should be, uh, and so he appointed Huss uh, to be the preacher at the provincial synod meetings to talk about clerical reform. Uh, and Huss gave his first sermon in 1404. Zbigniew liked it, renewed the appointment. Uh, the clergy, however, was not so impressed, particularly those against whom Huss was preaching. Uh, and uh, most of them were German, but some of them were Czech. So, you know, he's beginning now to get a little opposition, or at least people who aren't quite satisfied with the way he's doing. Uh, then in 1405, uh, in a little village outside of Prague, the priest miraculously discovered three communion wafers which had been hidden away in the wall. And they were covered in a red substance, which, blood, it must be a miracle. Like, you know, the face of the Virgin Mary on a tortilla, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, he displays these things. Pilgrims start coming for a, you know, just a free will offering. You can get in and see the miraculous things. Uh, and it, uh, it was turning into quite a thing. Uh, the archbishop sent Huss to investigate, who proved the whole thing was a fraud. It came to an end, uh, but it didn't make Huss any more friends amongst the corrupt clergy. Uh, and uh, Huss was really, really offended by that, um, just as today we might be offended by the sleazy televangelist who, uh, you know, makes us all look bad. That's the way Huss took that. Uh, in the meantime, this controversy over Wycliffe's articles is coming again, and, and good old Znoimo uh, defends it. 
uh, defends Wycliffe, which means he gets accused of heresy. Uh, and you have to realize heresy was a crime in those days. You know, if murder or theft is punishable by law, well, heresy is even worse because you, you offend against not just worldly authority, but against God's truth itself. Uh, and as we will see, uh, the punishment for heresy uh, could be pretty severe. Uh, now, good old Zenoimo, uh at this point, hastily explained that in proclaiming the ideas of Wycliffe, uh, he hadn't really meant anything by it. It was purely for academic, you know, discussion. Uh, he certainly didn't want to offend anything, and so it's all okay. Uh, anyway, Zbigniew, uh, the archbishop, didn't buy it. And uh, so he forbid uh, the teaching of remanence, that is, that the substance of the bread and wine remains in the sacrament uh, in any form whatsoever. He even went so far as to say, in referring to the communion wafer, you can't call it bread. And Huss wrote uh, an article on uh, the sacrament, De Corpore Christi, the body of Christ, uh, and uh, it was still, uh, he came out with a moderate view on this. He thought maybe Zbigniew was going a little far, but he did not deny the Orthodox Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. Uh, and uh, so at this point, Archbishop Zbigniew and Huss are still pretty close together. Uh, now, as of 1406, 147, another couple of years, and Huss would have finished his doctorate, uh, and, uh, you know, probably would have just settled back into uh, an academic position and we wouldn't be here today. Uh, but in 1407, uh, he, on the basis of this faulty communion wafer incident, Huss had gotten so incensed about it that uh, he preached such an extreme sermon uh, at the provincial synod that the archbishop did not renew his appointment for the next year. Uh, but still, there's not an absolute break between them. Uh, but also in 1407, and here the German-Czech politics and academic rivalries are coming in, uh, the Germans decided to put the Czechs down once and for all, put them in their place. And so a group of the German faculty charged uh, Stanislaus of Neumo before the, the papal curia, the papal court, uh, with Wycliffeite heresies. Uh, and uh, this got Rome all upset. Uh, they were with the Roman Pope at this time uh, because they, uh, the Catholicism had uprooted Wycliffeism in England pretty well, and they were not about to let it take root in uh, Bohemia because the Catholic Church realized this would be very destabilizing for the, the system that they had managed to build up. Uh, and um, so uh, Zbigniew, the archbishop, was terrified uh, that, uh, you know, somebody might be accused of major heresy and, and on his watch, as you might say. So he ordered the Czechs to recant, do away with Wycliffe completely. Uh, <coughs> the Czechs offered a compromise. They say, we will promise not to teach the condemned articles in their heretical, erroneous, and objectionable sense. Which means what? <laughs> well, anyway, the archbishop didn't buy that one either, and he said, just don't talk about Wycliffe. Okay. Uh, uh, but the archbishop, you know, is, is well, the rift between the archbishop and the Czech reform movement uh, has now begun over, over this. Uh, <clears throat> Stanislav of Znoimo and Stephen Palich head for Rome to answer the charges. And on the way, they got arrested by the liturgical police and were thrown into a dungeon and questioned severely. Uh, and they were scared out of their minds. Uh, and in fact, this brief imprisonment uh, sort of turned them around completely, and from being radical, you know, revisionists, they turned into the most arch-conservative people you can ever imagine, and ended up being the greatest enemies of Huss as time went on. 
uh, <coughs> but they, had, they were afraid of, of dabbling uh, in anything that might get them into trouble. Now, this had significance for Huss besides just losing two of his best friends, but the result is now Huss became the sole or main leader of the Czech reform movement. The uh, enmity of the Germans and some of the Czech clergy uh, that had, you know, been sort of spread around between Znoimo and Palich and, and Huss was now focused all on Huss. And anything that happens, he's either going to get the credit or he's going to get the blame. Human nature was pretty well the same back then as well. Well, that still might have been okay. But remember the great Western schism I mentioned where you, you had two popes each claiming to be the real pope? Uh, that came up again. And after several years of this confusion in 1408, 1409, the leaders of Europe decided we've got to resolve this issue. And so they called for a council of the church to meet in Pisa in 1409 to resolve who's the Pope. Which is in Italy, I believe. Yes. And Bohemia and its archbishop still supported the Roman line of popes. Uh, <coughs> however, uh, the king of uh, Bohemia, Wenceslas, Václav, uh, remember I said he and this other German guy were vying to become Holy Roman Emperor. Well, Somebody now promised uh, Wenceslas that if he would support, you know, the idea of the council at Pisa, uh, they would do what they could to get him made Holy Roman Emperor or confirmed as Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and so therefore, uh, the king of Bohemia decided, okay, I'm in favor of the council at Pisa. Okay. The only problem was that the archbishop absolutely refused to change his loyalty from the Pope of the Roman line. And that led to more problems. Uh, King Wenceslas went to the University of Prague for support for his position, and it turned out that the Czech faculty supported him. The German faculty did not. And so suddenly King Wenceslas develops a conscience, quote, conscience, and says, is it right that in their own university the Czechs are a minority? Should not the Czechs have the greater vote? And these German foreigners shouldn't, particularly since they don't agree with me. So he issues an imperial decree, reverses the ratio of the faculty, and surprise, surprise, the newly reorganized university uh, immediately declared in favor of the Council of Pisa as the king wanted. By the way, he never did get confirmed as Holy Roman Emperor, but that was one shyster against another. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> you might reflect on hypocrisy again here. Uh, but anyway, the Germans get mad, withdraw from the university, and go off and found their own university in Leipzig. Uh, and, but the archbishop still won't back down. He's still maintaining loyalty to Rome against the council. Uh, this was further complicated by the fact that when they met in Pisa, they decided at the council that neither of these two popes are going to be recognized as pope. We are electing one real pope. Only problem is neither of the other two would agree to resign or acknowledge the decision. So now instead of two popes, you have three popes. And this begins to get a little more hairy. Uh, in the meantime, though, Huss becomes the first rector of the newly reorganized University of Prague and got all of the credit amongst the Czechs uh, for having, uh, you know, finally won the victory and got our national rights established. Uh, and I think he was smart enough to realize it was really all political, but, but for good or ill, uh, he got the credit for it. Now, that's fine when the people are giving him credit. However, the archbishop really got ticked off at him about this time. He blamed Huss for the king's opposition and what had happened at the university. 
Uh, and so the archbishop uh, issued a decree uh, per, uh, restricting all preaching in Prague to parish churches. Now, if you s translate this into what it really meant, it meant, John Hush, you can't preach at Bethlehem Chapel anymore because it's not a parish church. So, in other words, he was trying to silence Hus and keep him from preaching. And Hus refused to acknowledge that. Uh, he appealed to the <coughs> Uh, the Pisan Pope. This gets through. Oh, and to add more confusion, this Pisan Pope was John the Twenty-Third. Now, if you remember back 40, 50 years ago, remember good old Pope John the Twenty-Third? Well, this isn't the same one. <laughs> <clears throat> this was bad old Pope John, and later on they decided he wasn't a real Pope, so they struck his name and number out, and that's how our Pope John is the 23rd, even though this one was John the 23rd. It, but anyway. Uh, but uh, Huss refused to obey the Archbishop's uh, prohibition about preaching, uh, and for the first time now, Huss really is in open opposition to the church authorities, to the church administration. Uh, okay. And the archbishop is mad. Now, the Pisan Pope, John the Twenty-Third, the Bad, uh, doesn't want to lose the support of the Archbishop of Bohemia, uh, who's, um, <clears throat> and so he appoints one of the cardinals to judge the case of Hus. This cardinal's name, by the way, was Odo de Colonna. Remember the cartoon character Odio Coloni back there? Well. It, somebody was having a good joke with us. But this cardinal really was Odo de Colonna. Uh, he summoned Huss uh, to appear before him and explain himself. Uh, now, Huss is not at this point being accused of heresy. He's uh, being accused of uh, <coughs> not obeying an administrative decision of his bishop. Big distinction. Uh, however, Huss also recalls that, remember that relig uh, liturgical police who arrested Znoimo and Palich and threw him into prison? Well, the one who did that was none other than Odo de Colonna. And so when Odo de Colonna summons him to appear before him, Huss figures, this is not going to work well. I think I will decline your invitation. And so he does. Uh, <clears throat> now, at this point, the king of Bohemia, good old Wenceslas, uh, supports Huss. Uh, the case bounces around in the Curia, and it doesn't seem to uh, be going too much of anywhere. Except then the king, remember that idea of dominion from Wycliffe, that the clergy, I mean the king, can seize, you know, property of church. Well, the king decides that he likes this monastery and that one, and he says, you're abusing your power, so I'm taking them from you. In other words, it's Wycliffeism right out in the open for everybody to see. Uh, and obviously, the archbishop condemns that uh, and pronounces an interdict on the city of Prague. Now, an interdict means that you cannot have normal church services. You cannot have baptisms. You cannot have weddings. You cannot have funerals. Certainly not communion. And to the medieval mind, that was scary because you know, the sacraments are what get you into heaven. Uh, so not being able to have the normal services of the church was a big thing. Uh, however, at this point, the king says, ignore it. And for some reason, and this I am not clear why, uh, the clergy of Prague sided with the king on this one. And it's never been made clear to me exactly why they did, but they did. Uh, <clears throat> the archbishop uh, refuses any kind of compromise, leaves for exile in Hungary, and dies on the way. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> now, I want to, uh, to say a word about Zbigniew of Hassenberg here. He and Huss ended up being on opposite sides. 
And that's a shame because they really could have been friends and worked together. Remember, they did at start for clerical reform. But because of all of these papal politics and German and Czech nationalism uh, and obscure Wycliffeite heresies, uh, they ended up on opposite sides. Both of them, I think, were trying to do the right thing. Uh, the archbishop didn't understand all the subtleties. He was trying to be the general and legislate, you know, proper conduct. Uh, but they were both too uncompromising to meet halfway, and uh, which I think is a shame. Well, anyway, at this point, things could have just settled down and gone on. The archbishop is dead. Uh, the new one seems to be, a, he and the king get along a little better. Uh, but once again, papal politics intervene. Uh, there is not only disagreement amongst these three popes as to who is the real pope, uh, but there is actual warfare. And so John the 23rd proclaims a crusade, not against Muslims, but against the fellow Christians who support one of the other popes. But as you know, warfare takes money. And the Pope came up with an idea that to finance this campaign, let's sell indulgences. And, you know, it's a pretty good deal for, you know, a quarter or a dollar and a half or whatever. You can buy time out of purgatory. Now, that is not the accurate Catholic doctrine, which I don't have time to explain to you. It's just this is not it. You, you can't buy it. Um, but that's the way it was presented. And so, in May of 1412, uh, two fellows, whose name happened to be Venceslaus of Tiem and Pax de Bologna, uh, show up in Prague with a whole raft of papal indulgences and nice chests to put the money in. Uh, by the way, it, they also had rights to uh, sell indulgences in Bohemia with the right to sublet. It was almost like a McDonald's franchise, you know, you could, the right to, do what? to sublet, so you know, sublet. yeah. Um, so anyway, they are the ones, they, you know, give you rights to do the South and you can do the West. And anyway, it, it comes into a, a big thing. You have people on the, on the street corner saying, get your indulgences here, two for a dollar, you know. And, uh, but that didn't happen in Bethlehem Chapel. Huss denounced this practice as selling salvation, uh, and uh, he did not in deny indulgences itself. There, you know, he did believe, like most medieval Christians, that the the great merits of Christ and the and the saints could be applied to you to sort of help you uh, again in purgatory, uh, but the idea of but simply a, it's supposed to have penance and sincerity behind your asking for this, not simply, you know, cash on the barrel head. And that's what Huss was denouncing, the commercialization of salvation. Uh, and so Huss preached against it. Uh, Huss expected the king to support him as he had supported him always before this. Uh, but this time the king did not support Huss. Now, you may say that he simply disagreed honestly by conscience. He, he didn't agree with it. Uh, what actually it was is these two guys who had the franchise for Bohemia uh, had promised the king a cut out of the revenues. And so, therefore, the king was all in favor of the indulgences. Uh, but this puts Huss sort of out the archbishop and the church administration He's fallen out with them. The king supported him, uh, much like later rulers would support Luther, uh, but now Huss has lost the king's support. Um, it ends up in a riot. Some of the students, university students who had heard Huss preach against it, uh, go out and start, you know, tearing down the indulgent signs. Uh, they get arrested. A mob forms in front of the jail demanding their release. Uh, the sheriff or whoever comes out promises, no, it, it, they'll be all right. We're going to let the boys go. They're just a little hot-headed. So the crowd goes away. 
Uh, and as soon as the crowd is gone, they lead the students out into the main square and behead them right there. Uh, another riot happens. Uh, and Huss has the bodies brought to Bethlehem Chapel uh, and uh, buries them as martyrs of the faith. Uh, once again, uh, he's getting further and further at odds with the political and established religious societies. Okay. John the 23rd now summons Huss to appear before him or be excommunicated, and if he doesn't obey, again, there will be an interdict on Prague. And at this point, Huss really breaks completely with the, the normal church administration. Uh, he appeals not to the Pope, but he appeals directly to Christ and said, you know, the earthly church is corrupt, is doing wrong, but our Lord is there. I appeal directly to Him. Uh, and that does not sound too radical to us, but if you realize that in their thinking, the, the church administration was the church. This is the means Christ has set up to bring you to salvation. You don't go around or over the earthly church. It is the absolute necessity. Church, uh, Huss really skipped over that and said, I don't care what the Pope said. I appeal to Christ. And in the end, that's what did him in. Uh, however, uh, this interdict was going to be a problem. <coughs> uh, and so he realizes that he's not going to back down, but it, it's going to bring suffering to all the people in Prague who can't get married or buried or whatever. So he decides to leave the city, uh, spends his time uh, doing some writing, standardizing the Czech language. He's the one who invented all of these little hotchecks and slashes uh, and uh, wrote his main work, De Ecclesia, which is on the church. So he's putting the time to good use. Uh, but finally, John the 23rd is forced to call a general council to resolve who's the pope. I mean, you can't have three. You just can't. Uh, so he, uh, now this time it did work, I'll let you know, they finally, got, but anyway. Uh, so he calls for a general council to meet uh, in Constance on the Feast of All Saints, which is November the 1st, that's right, 1414. Uh, and uh, Bohemia was in favor of this by now. One, they wanted to come and show that we're not all Wycliffeite heretics. Uh, they knew they had to deal with Huss in some way. And uh, so the king of Bohemia uh, sends two of his officials to persuade Huss to go to Constance uh, to, well, they say you'll have a chance to state your views and clear up all the misunderstandings. And he had been accused of a lot of things he never said. Uh, <clears throat> Huss believes that he is completely innocent in all of this. He wants to prove himself, and so Huss decides to go to Constance. Okay. Now, I know we're coming close to time, but I, I, can we have just like a seventh inning stretch here? I mean, I said I would have trouble setting, you know, for the whole Sermon on the Mount without a break. So, you know, <laughs> I think we need a little one right now. So just, just a couple of minutes, stand, stretch, get something to drink. And then we'll go with Huss to Constance. Now, he has a friend named John of Yesenitse, who is a lawyer. And John of Yesenitse realizes that Huss is going to get way over his head at Constance. Uh, if he appears there as one who has already been condemned for Wycliffeite heresy, he is doomed. Uh, and so he puts together a document trying to show that Huss has indeed been excommunicated, but for administrative disputes, not doctrinal reasons. And to sort of guarantee this, he posts notices, public notices, 
to say if anyone knows of any heresy that John Huss has committed, they should come forth. He got a certificate of orthodoxy from the new archbishop, Konrad Vechta, and even the papal inquisitor, who apparently didn't realize what he was signing, signed a testimonial that John Huss is a good guy. Okay. Now, but this means, in theory, if all of this works, that when Huss gets to Constance, he can have free and open discussion of his views and perhaps get some of the misunderstandings worked out. Uh, if he goes there as a condemned heretic, he would have no rights at all. Uh, and so John of Yesenica puts all of these documents together. He gives us a timeline so that he can keep straight as who said what, when, on what day, and what exactly did they say. So he figures that he's got Huss pretty well briefed for what he's going to find there. Uh, Huss himself was less practical. Uh, he composed a sermon uh, that he thinks he will get to preach before the council. Uh, he was smart enough, however, to leave behind his last will and testament just in case. Uh, but he really is pretty confident. And uh, so on the uh, 11th of October, 1414, he and his two officials that the emperor had sent or the king had sent uh, set off uh, for Constance. And he's really encouraged uh, on the journey because he has to go through Germany uh, to get there and remember the hostility of Germans and Czechs. But he's, he's welcome in all the little German villages. They, you know, come out and, and uh, treat him well. So he's, he's looking forward to this. Uh, the emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, had promised us a safe conduct uh, to Constance and back. And so they think, you know, he said he'd give us this, but we don't have it in hand. So one of them goes off to find the emperor to get the document. You know, you, you might need this, uh, just to be sure. Anyway, they arrive in Constance on the 3rd of November, 1414. Uh, Huss looks around and finds a, a very nice, clean, cheap rooming house uh, at, in the house of the widow Fida in St. Paul's Street. Uh, by the way, the house is still there. They've renamed the street to Huss Street. And there's a little plaque uh, on the front of the house saying this is where John Huss stayed. So, that's nice. Okay. However, while all this is going on, Huss's enemies, you know, the Germans and wealthy Czech clergy, have not been idle. Uh, they are urging the council officials to arrest Huss as a heretic. Uh, they spread a rumor that he tried to escape from the city hidden in a hay wagon, uh, which is sort of silly because he wasn't under arrest at that point, but, you know, they, they're doing anything to make him look bad. Uh, and through all of this, John Huss, bless his heart, is totally oblivious. Uh, he doesn't see what's going on. He, he uh, writes another theological work on giving the, the chalice uh, the wine at communion to the lay folk, uh, which became a hallmark of the Hussite reform. Uh, and that, at that time, the Catholic Church only gave the bread to the laity for various reasons, which we don't have time to get into. Uh, and uh, Huss is often given credit for making that a uh, sort of hallmark of the Hussite reform, that you, the laity gets the chalice as well, uh, as Christ said, drink of it, all of you. Uh, actually, uh, Huss did not institute that at Bethlehem Chapel. Uh, it was his caretaker who took over when he left to go to Constance who began giving the chalice to the uh, lay people. And his friend was another of those nice names. Jakubek of Stschibro. Uh, if anybody asks you who really started giving the chalice to the lay people, it was good old Jakubek of Stschibro. <laughs> I'm sure that will come up in conversation frequently. Uh, 
But anyway, Huss did approve of it, but he did not originate it. And it, as I say, even the chalice became the emblem of the Hussites in later developments. Uh, but Huss is working on that theological treatise. He writes very chatty letters back to his friends in Prague, uh, and those have been gathered together, uh, the letters of John Huss, and they make really interesting reading. Uh, and, uh, you know, while all of this theological stuff and political stuff is going on and they're trying to get him arrested, uh, he's writing back home about, boy, they sure charge an arm and a leg for anything here in Constance. It's really expensive. Uh, and um, he praises the performance of his horse, whose name was Robstein. <laughs> This is a freebie. Uh, if you're ever playing Moravian trivia, you know, what's the name of John Huss' horse? Robstein. So that ought to be. Uh, but as I say, you know, Huss, while he should have been working on his defense or trying countermeasures, uh, was doing things like this. But his enemies did have success. Uh, he is not allowed to preach before the council. Uh, for one thing, they knew that he would be preaching against the uh, bad morals of the clergy. Uh, and since John the 23rd himself was no lily of the valley, they didn't want that coming out. Uh, they certainly, now here, remember, they're trying to so solve who's the Pope and therefore who has, you know, authority in the church for salvation. Uh, they don't want radical reforms. They don't want Riclifite heresy, so they arrest him. Now, you may say, wait a minute, they gave John Huss a safe conduct. Read the fine print. Well, two reasons they could get away with this. One, he's a heretic. You don't have to keep your word to heretics. They're people of the devil. You don't have to keep your promises. But second, again, read the fine print. It says, John Huss shall not be arrested, molested, folded, stapled, mutilated, whatever, on his way from Prague to Constance and on his way from Constance to Prague. It doesn't say in Constance. So by the letter of the law, they could do that. <laughs> so he is subject to procedures of one accused of heresy and awaiting trial. Now, the inquisitorial system was stacked against the accused. The one accused did not have to be told specifically what the charges were against them. Uh, the details of witnesses did not have to match uh, exactly. They figured, well, this one says he did something wrong, that one, did, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, so he must have done something if he didn't do this. He did something, so that's guilty. Um, he could be arrested and detained to prevent his flight. Um, they would examine a person's works if they were literary to see if there was any heretical statements in there. And most of all, in this system, you are assumed guilty until proven innocent, the exact opposite of what we say. Now, do you have any defense? Well, yes. Um, you can exclude a certain number of witnesses who are testifying against you uh, if they're enemies of yours for reasons of personal enmity. Um, you know, I he and I haven't gotten along since we were eight years old, so obviously whatever he says shouldn't be taken into account. Okay, you could do that. However, heretics are hateful people. This means they would have a lot of enemies. So if you exclude too many as enemies, this is proof you're a heretic because you have all of these enemies. You see, the logic flows. Uh, and uh, so anyway... Uh, you could be kept in prison to wear you down. If not, you would finally be handed over to the secular authorities for execution because the church is holy and obviously the church can't kill people. They just hire other people to kill people. So, uh, now, <coughs> on the 28th of November, 1414, 
uh, messengers come from the council inviting Huss to come for a conference. The fact that the house was surrounded by armed soldiers was a pure coincidence. Uh, he's taken in, he's left sitting in the hallway to cool his heels. Uh, a, quote, simple friar comes by and tries to entangle him into saying something, you know, that's wrong. You know, hey, that John Wycliffe, he's a neat guy, isn't he? You know, um, Huss doesn't fall for that. But at 4 p.m., they formally arrest him. His friends protest, uh, but one of his friends is more practical and goes back to the rooming house and gets Huss's fur coat and his breviary, his devotional book, figuring he's going to need it. Uh, he is kept for a while in one of the uh, uh, other officials' houses, but then a week later he's taken to the Dominican Monastery there in Constance. Uh, and that's a neat place. It's now the Insel Hotel. It's a luxury hotel. It was the Dominican Monastery. Uh, and uh, people can come and stay there, you know, and see all the Huss sites and, you know, all of that. It's a really nice place. Uh, however, Huss did not get kept in that part of it. He was taken down into the depths uh, next to the latrine, and the noxious fumes made him deathly ill. Uh, they sent a doctor to deal with him because they didn't want him to die as a martyr in prison. They wanted him to recant. Uh, but what he mostly needed was a change of scene. Um, anyway, now the council members know that Huss has a lot of support back in Bohemia and Moravia, that the Czechs, m many of them like him, so they actually went sort of easy on him. Uh, he, he, the witnesses were sworn, you know, took their oaths in his presence, which didn't have to be. Uh, he denied being a Wycliffeite, and they said, all right, we'll look at your writings. Uh, the emperor finally arrives in town and protests lightly that Huss has been arrested. Uh, the council officials said, look, we're going to depose two popes. We can do an emperor at the same time. So the emperor decides, okay, I withdraw my objections. Uh, another heroic stand. Uh, Huss is moved finally to a better cell, so he does begin to recover. Uh, he is allowed to write letters home, uh, which given the rigors of the system may seem a little odd, except uh, his friends simply bribed the jailer to let him have paper and pens and smuggle them out, which was accepted practice at the time. Uh, it's almost like you know waitresses and tips now, they don't really get paid enough to live on, but the, you expect to give them tips and that's so jailers got next to nothing, but you know, bribes were the way they supported themselves. Um, anyway, uh, despite all of John of Yesenitz's efforts, Huss is to be treated as an already condemned heretic, and so really his case is lost from the start. Uh, now, the next few months, however, the council is too busy declaring itself the supreme authority in Christendom uh, and uh, getting rid of John the Twenty-Third, uh, and uh, and all of that. Um, but on Palm Sunday night, he is taken, moved to the Archbishop's Castle at Gottlieben, which is north of town. Uh, and you know the problem with his cell before it was down underground and dank and damp and and all of that. Well, this is the opposite. They put him in a high tower with you know, open windows and uh, the wind blows through and, and so it's the opposite extreme. Um, they actually put him in chains at this point. Uh, they were careful to say he has a longer chain for daytime so that he can walk around and around. That's as close as they got to torturing him, however. Uh, anyway, he finally gets a, a hearing on the 5th of June, which is only a public relations ploy. Uh, they actually started without him, uh, and uh, when his friends found out and demanded that he be brought to his hearing, uh, he was allowed only to give yes or no answers. You know, like, have you stopped beating your wife? Yes or no? <laughs> There's nothing you can say that's going to come out good. Uh, then Huss got offended and simply refused to say anything 
which they said, see, his silence is witness that he's guilty. So, you know, uh, they go on like this for a while. They finally, his friends uh, start arguing with the judges uh, and it ends up in a practical riot and, uh, you know, they're just not used to discussing charges with heretics. Uh, two days later on the 7th of June, in the midst of an eclipse of the sun, talk about eerie, uh, he's brought in again. And this eclipse of the sun was taken as a great omen. But depends on which side you look at it. You know, is God displeased they're treating us this way or is God, you know, making it dark because of this heretic? You could take it either way. Uh, anyway, uh, one of the cardinals, Cardinal Dailly, who in his own right, would have been a church reformer, except he needed to save the church at this point, uh, urges Huss to throw himself on the mercy of the council. Uh, he says, you know, two ways lay open before you. Throw yourself on the mercy of the council, accept whatever we say, recant, uh, and we will deal, deal kindly and humanely with you. Or you can demand another hearing, and we will not deal kindly and humanely with you. Huss is stubborn and demands another hearing. Okay. <coughs> so finally, 30 charges are brought against him. Um, such things as he believes in predestination so as to make the church unnecessary. Uh, sinful officials lose their authority. He defends Wycliffe. Uh, he, um, you know, doesn't believe in transubstantiation, etc., etc. Indulgences, the sacramental system, Canon law, probably motherhood, America, and a hot lunch for orphans, everything. Um, I couldn't find it last time I looked, but I, I believe one charge was that he claimed to be the fourth member of the Trinity. Do the math. Uh, anyway, Huss made notes about this, and those were preserved, oddly enough, and obviously he denied them all, and, and he tried to explain that, you know, the official... Uh, doesn't lose his authority, but he doesn't exercise it worthily if he's not doing it as God intended, etc. It's not indulgences I'm against, but the sale of indulgences. Well, none of this made the least difference. Uh, and from that time on, they simply urged, look, recant. Take it back. Uh, Huss says, I didn't say this stuff. How can I recant it? They said, well... How about you abjure it? He says, it's the same thing. He said, well, no, technically it's not. And, but Huss says, no, that, uh, you know, I didn't say it and, and all, I want to be vindicated. You know, I'm not guilty. You need to acknowledge that. And so he is condemned. Uh, they even let him say, well, how about, how about as a former you say, although some things have been sworn falsely against me, I abjure all of this. And he says, if I say some things were said falsely against me, that means some things were not said falsely, and therefore I'm guilty of some things, so no, I'm not buying it. Well, he's condemned. Uh, and like I mentioned, one of these cardinals was sort of, you know, wanted to reform the church. Several of them did, in fact. But remember, they had an impossible mess with three popes and everything going around, and they got to get the church put back together. Uh, and I've often said that, that Huss was rocking the boat when everybody was already seasick. And that's basically what it was. They did not have time to get the niceties with this obscure bohemian. So basically, like the tank rolling over the ant, the council keeps going and Huss gets caught up in that. Uh, on the 6th of July, he is taken to the cathedral. And some of the columns inside the cathedral are the same now as they were then. Basically, it's been rebuilt. So don't think you can go to Constance and stand exactly where Huss did. Anyway, he's taken to the cathedral. He falls on his knees in silent prayer. Uh, the bishop... One of the bishops preaches on the necessity of uprooting heretics. Uh, the charges are read. Huss tries to answer them and is told the time for speaking is past. Uh, the condemnation is read. And then in what I think is probably 
one of the cruelest things, he is made to put on the vestments for mass, the amice, the alb, the maniple, the cincture, the stole, and the chasuble, and then they rip these off of him one by one with an appropriate curse. Then they took a paper hat like a dunce's cap on which were painted three devils, put it on his head, and lead him out to the stake. Uh, now you may have seen some of these pictures of Huss at the stake standing on a little pile of kindling and looking pious. Actually they piled straw and wood up to your neck almost like a you know, almost like a beehive or a beaver's nest or something anyway. So this is getting serious. He is chained, not tied to the stake because the, the rope would burn through. You don't want him coming loose, so you chain him. Uh, and then the imperial marshal uh, asked him for one last time to recant. And... I want to just read the last little bit because it's in, in the words of, of Huss's friends, uh, uh, friend who wrote an eyewitness account of his martyrdom. The imperial marshal asked him one last time if he wished to recant. To this Huss replied in a loud voice, God is my witness that those things that are falsely ascribed to me and of which the false witnesses accuse me I have never taught or preached but that the principal intention of my preaching and of all my other acts or writings was solely that I might turn men from sin. And in that truth of the gospel that I wrote, taught, and preached in accordance with the sayings and expositions of the holy doctors, I am willing gladly to die today. And at those words the officials gave the signal and the torch was applied to the pyre. Huss's friend, Peter of Mladenjavice, carefully recorded the last moments of his beloved master. When the executioners at once lit the fire, the master immediately began to sing, in a, very Moravian, began to sing in a loud voice. At first, Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy upon us. Secondly, Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy upon me. And in the third place, thou who art born of Mary the Virgin, and just then, as he began to sing the third time, the wind blew the flame into his face, and thus praying within himself and moving his lips and his head, he expired in the Lord. While he was silent, he seemed to move before he actually died for about the time one can quickly recite the Our Father two or three times. And so died Master John Huss of Bohemia, who an in intricate series of events had brought to this violent end. When the fire had burned down, the executioners took special care that his head and heart were thoroughly consumed, then loading the ashes into a cart, lest the checks preserve them as relics, they bore them away and flung them into the quiet waters of the Rhine River, which flowed nearby. And at last, the turbulent life of John Huss had ended in rest. Any questions at this point? Okay. Well, I don't think I've ever heard a description of John Huss's life as any, any more exciting than that. Really yeah. it, it's a good story. If, you, if the names were a little easier to pronounce, it would help. But I, I've said that, you know, Czech is the language you get after God used up all the vowels in Vinic Italian. But, yes, Betsy. How quickly did people start seeing him as a martyr? Almost immediately. Uh, in fact, his name, uh, Hus, is, is like from Husa, the Czech word for goose. And they had a code to send back to Prague, you know, the goose is cooked, meaning that they had killed Huss. And that's where that expression comes from. Yeah. But uh, there were riots in the streets. His friend Jerome of Prague was also burned at the stake about a year later. And after that, the Hussite Wars broke out and the Catholic forces and the imperial forces um, <coughs> took, you know, proclaimed crusades against the Hussites and great warfare. 
Uh, and uh, that's where we finally, in 1457, said, you know, is this really what Jesus wanted the church to be? And so that's when he said, let's just sort of drop out uh, and, and start over. And that's where the Moravians came out of that. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but, in, but the followers of Huss, the more moderate followers, we were radical followers. Everybody needs to be radical at one point in your history. We got ours over with soon. Uh, but the, uh, the more moderate ones, conservative ones, uh, who didn't change Catholic ways too much, uh, had a special feast day for him, and they had proper chants and scripture readings and everything. So, but he's, he was known as a martyr almost from the beginning. Yes? Who were the ones that actually executed him? Who were those people? They, Some it, kind of strange it, group? It would, well, the Council of Constance condemned him. And, and, yeah. and then they turned him over to the imperial, the emperor's people. Because as I say, the church could not shed blood. So they just appointed somebody else to do it. Uh, well, let's see. He would have been 28, 68, about 43, somewhere in there. And he never married? No, as a priest, he would not have been allowed to. Yes? The emperor was whom? Uh, Sigismund. What? Sigismund. And he was Austrian, wasn't he? No. Uh, well, yeah, he was of a Czech family. Oh, was it China? Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. He was the son of Charles IV, who had married Austrian, is how he got to be Holy Roman Emperor. But, yeah. Okay, anything else? I'm just curious, Daniel. Uh, I just want to make sure I got it straight. You said that he was condemned for, not for what he said, but for what he didn't say. Mm -hmm. that, I don't know if I heard that right or not, but it seems like he was accused of things, but he... I guess I'm kind of wondering, just bottom line, what was he accused of, and yeah. why, was, why was he burned at the stake? Okay, well, as I say there at the end, he was accused of uh, flouting the authority of the church, of denying the efficacy of the sacraments, of having wrong beliefs about the Holy Communion, uh, uh, and about purgatory and indulgences. Uh, it's interesting, though, a Catholic theologian in the 1960s did a, a thorough study of Huss's works. And that theologian concluded that actually Huss didn't really teach all of those things. Huss was correct. He was being accused of things he didn't say. He merely offended the wrong people. Uh, but that the only heresy he could find in Huss was denying the infallibility of the Pope which that doctrine wasn't promulgated until 400 years later, so it's sort of hard to hold him accountable for it. Uh, but, um, but that's basically what it was about. Yes, sir? I always heard that one of the accusations was that he preached in Czech rather than Latin. Uh -huh. Is that true? Uh, well, he did preach in Czech. Uh, rather than Latin, though that was permissible. I mean, that was not one of the charges. It was somewhat unusual. Uh, however, it's interesting that the you know, great you know, preacher to the people in Czech uh, wrote his notes in Latin because he could read it easier than Czech. So, yes, sir. Hmm. That may be. That was never taken away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, John Paul II, I understand, was about to lift the condemnation and say Constance got it wrong. Uh, however, his advisor, who was Cardinal Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict, reminded John Paul that the same Constance, Council of Constance that condemned Huss also established him as in the right line of popes. <laughs> and if you throw away Constance on that, you know, so they decided just to hold off. <laughs> but, okay, well, 
anyway, that's the basic story. Now you get to make something of it as you will.